No, it's making another connection. It's a multi-step process. I see a sign that says now streaming on Facebook. Great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's Tea Time with the Jackson Center. With me today, I have Jim Johnson. Uh, Jim uh, was named the prosecutor of the residual special court for Sierra Leone in fall of last year. He had previously served as the chief of prosecutions for the special court for Sierra Leone, as well as he is a former president and CEO of the Robert H. Jackson Center. He also is the director of the International Humanitarian Law Roundtable, the managing director of Justice Consultancy International, and he's an adjunct professor of law and the director of the Henry T. King War Crimes Research Office at Case Western Reserve University School of Law. Jim, welcome. Uh, gosh, thank you very much. You wouldn't know I'm retired, would you? <laughs> it certainly doesn't sound that way now. No. But, but it's so, a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be back. Great, great. And I'm so thrilled that you could join us today. So we are going to be talking about Nuremberg's legacy in the world today. Um, and, you know, as I am doing a course of doing a couple of these teas, I have sort of set the scene for them. So they know, obviously, in 1945 that the Nuremberg trials in 45 into 46 that the Nuremberg trials occurred. Um, the International Court of Justice was established as the judicial branch of the United Nations in 1945. And then we've also spoken very briefly about the Rome Statute, um, which was uh, uh, the International Criminal Court uh, established in 1998, the Rome Statute itself became effective in 2002. Um, and there were a couple of international tribunals prior to the Rome Statute being ratified. So why don't we start off by talking a little bit about those? Uh, sure, sure. And, 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 you know, it might be helpful to, to provide just a little more context, maybe, because, and, and again, I've listened to a few of the tea times, but, uh, but not all of them. And so uh, maybe to perhaps just, just to remind everybody just how significant Nuremberg was and I the charter, the London charter in creating the Nuremberg Tribunal. Because, you know, throughout history, uh, Nuremberg was a first. It was very much a first. Uh, never before had you had trials for war crimes, crimes against humanity, for crimes against peace uh, at the international level, certainly. Very, very little at the national level. Maybe you had had some trials at the national level throughout history and violating the customs of warfare. But Nuremberg was very, very much as a first from the international level. In fact, leading up to World War I, you really have to appreciate that going to war and waging a war and attacking your neighbor was not necessarily a violation of international law. Uh, you know, before you had the Hague Conventions in 1907 that still didn't outlaw going to war, it merely stated that before you go to war, you must declare war. And of course, we all know very much, you know, you, you hear the story of the Japanese making an attempt to at least notify Roosevelt, notify the US in the hours before Pearl Harbor that a state of war or some type of state of war existed. And of course, failures that didn't happen. But right. leading up until, until uh, World War I, going to war was not illegal. You just had to declare war. You had to state your intentions. It was the surprise attack. But then again, you didn't have to declare war long before you actually attacked. And in some instances, the law could have required that almost simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So after- Certainly, depending on where you needed to notify, you could be attacking at one end of a country. And if you had to notify somebody far at the other end, it probably well, already would have started. Well, possibly, yeah, <laughs> possibly. And, and after World War I, you did have a few, a few attempts at the international level to outlaw going to war, outlaw that aggressive war or going to war, both in the, uh, in the League of Nations and the Kellogg-Briand Pact. But mm -hmm. the problem with those, there was no teeth behind it. There was no enforcement mechanism. They tried to outlaw it, uh, but if someone violated the Kellogg-Briand Pact, for instance, there was no real remedy. There was no enforcement mechanism available, as well as the League of Nations Charter. And so coming out of World War II, 
you had, um, you know, you had very, the atrocities, of course, that came about in World War II leading up to the Nuremberg trials. And to whereas you had the laws and customs of war was fairly codified in the Geneva Conventions leading up to that point, in the Hague Conventions leading up to that point on the laws and customs of warfare, and again, dealing with how you fight the war, how you treat victims of war, uh, aggr aggression was very, very new in that, well, new in the sense that um, you had efforts to codify it in the 20s, but certainly new in the sense of, of, do you have established international law or custom going into Nuremberg when it looks at aggression? But anyway, I forgot what you asked me. Let me think. <laughs> so we were going to start with um, the the couple of tribunals that uh, sure. happened before the Rome Statute was um, was signed, or actually before it became effective. And so that would be the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and then also the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda. And please keep me on track because I can get to talking once in a while. Normally, Always. my students are afraid to speak up and tell me to get back on track, but I trust you you will tell me to get back on track. I shall but, indeed, uh, next year. But sure, um, after Nuremberg, of course, you saw a uh, movement with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. You saw the updated Geneva Conventions, adding the, the, uh, pro adding the fourth Geneva Convention on Occupation, Lessons of World War II. You saw the protocols to the Geneva Conventions in 1977, but no efforts at accountability. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that was you know, probably a result of the Cold War. That's as good of explanation as any. You just had no interest or desire in accountability, no political will for accountability until mm -hmm. the end of the Cold War. And with the establishment of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in 1993. And of course, Rwanda followed on in 1994. And, uh, and, and this, you know, many would say that with the beginning of the ICTY, we kind of went into an age of accountability. In other words, there was great interest, both within the UN in the Security Council and on the world stage and among world leaders generally. There was an interest in accountability. And uh, that set the stage for, for a number of ad hoc tribunals. After all, Nuremberg was an ad hoc tribunal. It was set up for a very specific purpose, very specific time period, very specific location, as was ICTY, ICTR, and my tribunal, the Special Court for Sierra Leone. But uh, these were the start of the ad hoc tribunals. And then, of course, we led up to the permanent tribunal with the negotiation of the Rome Treaty and completing the negotiation in 1998. Well, let's start with then talking about your work with the Special Court for Sierra Leone. So the, if I remember correctly, the Special Court was set up in 2002 um, and you joined, uh, you joined them in 2003 as a senior trial attorney. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. Okay. The, and so uh, what, what attracted you to this work? <clears throat> well, uh, probably a phone call might be the best way to describe that. I think that's how it usually happened. At least that's <laughs> how it happened then. Today, it probably is an email, but, but at that time, it, it was a phone call. And uh, Dave Crane gave me a call. And yeah. this, was, this was in earlier 2002. And he... Um, he was at the time in, in, in the running to be, to be named the first prosecutor for the Special Court for Sierra Leone. <clears throat> and Dave and I, of course, go back to, well, I guess about 19, 1983 is when Dave and I first, first uh, met. And we worked together closely over the years, as well as the uh, work together for three years at the, at the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General School. And Dave mm -hmm. gave me a call and he said, look, I'm, I may be going to Sierra Leone. I may become the prosecutor and uh, might you be interested? And of course, uh, I, was, uh, I was coming up on retirement from the army. I was coming up, I was a few months away at that time from having served 20 years and retirement eligible. And uh, my focus throughout a large part of my army career 
was indeed international law and gotcha. the laws of war, war crimes. That's what Dave and I taught together for three years. Dave was my immediate supervisor at the JAG school. And uh, so uh, I knew a little bit about the subject, let's say. And uh, it sounded like a very, very interesting opportunity in time. And uh, that's how I got there, a phone call. So talk to us a little bit about the work that you were doing. Was there, is there, was there such a thing as a typical day? Um, what, what, you know, to sort of put together, you know, between Nuremberg and Sierra Leone, yes, we had the ICTY and the ICTR, but this is sort of creating something from the ground up again. And so well, what, what did that look like? Yes and, yes and no. There, it, the answer is always going to be yes and no. But, um, but uh, we, were, we were the first tribunal since Nuremberg that was physically located in the country where the crimes occurred. And that was very, very significant in, in just so many ways, uh, you know, probably most of all being that we're there and we're there, mm -hmm. we're there with our clients. Uh, the people of Sierra Leone, the victims of that conflict were our clients and we were, we were there with them. And so, um, you know, when we arrived, well, let me, let me digress for just a minute, if, if you don't mind. This is a tea time <laughs> conversation. Um, you know, we were fortunate in that by the time our tribunal had been created, the ICTY and ICTR had been around for, let's see, seven and eight years. Yep. And so uh, they had many procedures in place, which we looked at and picked and choose as far as investigating procedures, as as uh, far as policies, as far as best practices, we certainly looked at those and, and, and David, of course, adapted those to our situation. Uh, but, but also what was probably even more significant is that the, the jurisprudence was fairly well established by the time we were created. Because one of the biggest things that the ICTY in particular and the ICTR that followed was had to do was really establish the jurisprudence because the only jurisprudence in place at that time was Nuremberg. Gotcha. And so what we're looking at crimes against humanity, we're looking at war crimes, we're looking at what are the elements to these crimes? What do you, what specifically do you have to prove to attain a conviction in these crimes? Uh, what are the rules of evidence? What should the rules of evidence be? Applying the rules of evidence to international tribunals. So although the jurisprudence was, was indeed, it, it was still developing and always being fine tuned, but, um, but we had seven and eight years of jurisprudence to rely on coming off of the, uh, off of the Rwandan and Yugoslavian tribunals. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, a very big benefit to us. Absolutely. And it, it, when we were looking at, at getting into our investigations, we had guides on what we were looking for. We had the elements of the crimes. We, were, we knew generally what we had to prove. And so when we were building our investigative teams and training our investigative teams, we had something to draw upon for the types of evidence for what we needed to prove these cases. Oh, nice. uh, now, to go back, you asked what's a typical day. Well, at an international tribunal, there's never a typical day and um, you got to keep in mind that that uh, I arrived in country <clears throat> in January 2003. Okay. Uh, David Crane and the first ones arrived, first uh, members of the Office of the Prosecutor in the Special Court started arriving in August of 2002. And so investigations were getting off the ground. And by the time I arrived, David had put in place a pretty fair investigative plan. He had drawn on a lot of very, very smart people in, in listening and, and learning from them. Uh, Brenda Hollis, of course, who was one of the, uh, who's now the prosecutor in Cambodia. Uh, Brenda was one of the very, very first ones into Bosnia hmm. when uh, the ICTY was set up in, in 1993. And she yeah. followed shortly thereafter and was with the IT, ICTY for a number of years, coming back to the States for a few years in between. But, um, but by the time I got there, we had a pretty good investigative plan in place. 
But you have to remember that when you go into a country like Sierra Leone, into any of these, into Yugoslavia, into Rwanda, you have to remember the whole country is a crime scene. Mm -hmm. And everyone has been affected in one way. Everyone is a victim or they have a close friend or a close family member who were victims. And so, um, so it's, you, you really have to, you just have to be prepared for what you find when you get there. And you have to um, be able to focus your investigations into what, what do we really need? What's important? What are the crimes that we're looking at? How do we, um, how do we identify the major crime scenes? How do we identify the, the victims, the witnesses? You know, in some cases, it's just getting on the ground and, and asking questions and one witness leads you to another, to another, to another. But, um, but you very much have to, have to have a plan in place. You very much have to appreciate that, that everyone there is somehow a victim to these crimes. In uh, a location like Sierra Leone, uh, distinguishing the victims from the perpetrators mm -hmm. isn't always an easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're looking at child soldiers, as we were, we were the first court to gain a conviction for the conscription and use of child soldiers at the international level. Uh, you have both perpetrators and, and victims in the same person yep. because yep. the children are, even though they were conscripted and they were turned into killing machines, so to speak, uh, they're very young and they're a victim as well. So, so you have to, um, you have to very much uh, know what you're going into and be prepared for that. Uh, I have to imagine course, just mentally that would be hard too for, for people who have not been exposed to that, certainly for the people who have been dealing with it for the duration of mm -hmm. the war, yes. But then for someone like you coming in just sort of as a, initially as a, seeing this for the first time, just trying to wrap your head around around something like that happening. It was, uh, well, and I was there for nearly 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you, you, uh, well, you have to learn to, to, to appreciate the environment that you're in and deal with it. Gotcha. Uh, but we had a few things going for us. And, and that might be another reason to kind of discuss some of the, the differences between our tribunal, the Special Court for Sierra Leone, the Third International Tribunal, and the Age of Accountability up and running versus uh, Rwanda and Yugoslavia. Yep. Well, and you had mentioned that for for uh, the special court, you were the first in country. Um, so Yugoslavia and Rwanda, obviously not then in, in those countries. So was I, did you find people in country cooperative? Were there, were there mechanisms set up where there were joint responsibilities or joint task force to help, to help investigate or or, or, or uh, training some of the lawyers, or you know, what was what was that cooperation like? Well, yes, we had we had a, we had cooperation and support from the government of Sierra Leone, which um, which was very significant and important for us. Mm -hmm. uh, ICTY and ICTR were created by the UN Security Council. They were imposed on the governments and the uh, the states that they went into. Mm -hmm. They, of course, for that very reason, the seats of those tribunals were not in Yugos. The ICTY was in The Hague. The mm -hmm. uh, Rwanda was, uh, the Rwandan tribunal was next door in, in Tanzania. And mm -hmm. so you, you, you didn't have them located there. We were in Sierra Leone. And also, we were not a direct creation of the Security Council like, like the Rwandan Yugoslavian tribunals. We were authorized by the Security Council, but what started our tribunal was a request from the government of Sierra Leone to the United Nations for help. Hmm. And that's, that was a significant difference in our case. Uh, the Security Council looked at it, authorized the Secretary General to enter into an agreement with the government of 
the Sierra Leone and, um, and create and establish the tribunal. We were known as, we were, there's always a name and uh, we were all ad hoc tribunals, but we were known as a hybrid ad hoc tribunal because gotcha. we had that, um, because we had that uh, relationship with Sierra Leone government. The Sierra mm -hmm. Leone government wanted us there. They uh, were obliged by the terms of the agreement with the UN to, to provide support to the tribunal as we requested. They were obliged to follow our court directives. And, and what's even more and a huge difference for us is that the Sierra Leone police seconded throughout the life of the tribunal, uh -huh. a number of senior criminal investigators from their police force to the tribunal to assist in our investigations. As well as, of course, we had a number of Sierra Leone attorneys on our staff one third of the judges of our tribunal were selected by the government of Sierra Leone. Two thirds of the judges on our tribunal were selected by the secretary general. Uh, prosecutor, the registrar were uh, selected by the secretary general. The deputy prosecutor at the time was selected by the government of Sierra Leone. So we had a relationship with the government of Sierra Leone and we had support. And, and that's, um, you know, I can't say how valuable that was to us, particularly in our investigations, mm -hmm. because we had um, some very, very good, uh, we, we got the best of the best when it came to the Sierra Leone police investigators that were seconded to the office of the prosecutor. And of course, their knowledge of the country, their familiarity with the conflict, because they were there throughout the sure. duration of the conflict, their ability to take our investigators, to take uh, with our investigative teams, to go to the crime scenes, to interact with the victims, to gain trust of the victims was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, quite frankly, a group of, uh, when you go into small villages, and like I say, most of them were crime scenes. Uh, when the special court went in one side of the village, within minutes, the whole village knew we were there. Yep. And, um, and so we had that help to build trust with our, with our victims. Several things helped us build trust with our victims. But to have the uh, Sierra Leone police investigators as part of our team to speak the language, to understand the culture, and to team those up with international investigators that were part of the Office of the Prosecutor that brought to it the expertise in investigating international crimes, the evidence processes that need to be followed to collect evidence and to ensure we were collecting evidence that, was, that would indeed be useful and properly preserved and follow evidence handling procedures by teaming up the national and the international investigators and then, of course, in the first years, we had attorneys on those investigative missions mm -hmm. going up country as well. And that provided for a very, very strong investigative teams to get in and get the information we needed. And nice. so that was very, very helpful. Uh, that's, yeah, you know, that's kind of one of the examples. I, I haven't spoken enough about the uh, Sierra Leone attorneys that uh, were hired and part of the Office of the Prosecutor as well as throughout the court. Uh, Sierra Leoneans that uh, were part of the registry uh, that were, that were assist, assisted with the chambers were phenomenal. And so that helped our court. Yeah, it um, certainly sounds like that cooperation would have been helpful. Well, so and, and you. they're in a very different environment than Yugoslavia or Rwanda since you, because would, you were still going after a head of state in, in the Sierra Leone. Um, that's a, a very different parameter. Yeah, and and I didn't and I, and I hinted at uh, you know some of the other things that greatly assisted in our uh, in doing our job and in our investigations was the uh, the outreach program that was initiated mm -hmm. very, very from the very very beginning uh, with David Crane and 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 then the registry uh, late at a later point assumed and expanded and and further developed that outreach program. But uh, you know, David Crane points out how he traveled the whole country as, as well as I did in my time in Sierra Leone. 
uh, we would travel the country, we would hold town hall meetings, we would listen to our clients, hear their stories, hear who they felt was responsible. And, um, and it, it, through the outreach program with the OTP and then the registry, we were able to maintain those lines of communication and information sharing with the population as a whole. And that yeah. was a that was a, a very important asset. Very on it, early on, it was important in in developing trust for investigations and building trust among the population to accept our investigators and to come forward with their stories. And then, of course, later on, uh, after at every stage during the proceedings, whenever we would have a um, a, a conviction, whenever we would have significant events in the process, a judgment, a sentencing. Uh, the prosecutor at the time and myself, uh, we would travel and of course, members of the registry outreach team, we would travel throughout the country and, um, and explain what just happened mm -hmm. and take their questions and answer them. So, um, so that certainly made a, it, it, that relationship that we were able to have with with the government of Sierra Leone, with the people of Sierra Leone, went a long ways to making our tribunal a success. Yeah, and it sounds as if uh, you know one of we talked about in one of our first teas that one of the things that was important to Justice Jackson was that the Nuremberg process be very open and transparent, and that people understand um, the the process, the judgments, the crimes, and everything. And it sounds like that's really part of his legacy that you were carrying forward in Sierra Leone um, and to make sure that in order for the process and eventually the judgments to be accepted and understood, you had to keep bringing people along every step That's of the right. way. I mean, you, you can't state and overstate how important transparency is to these processes. And, uh, you know, particularly in, when you look at Nuremberg and Germany and, uh, and um, you know, we may have had it a little bit easier than than Justice Jackson because uh, because um, they weren't we were looking at victims in many cases they were looking at the vanquished but mm -hmm. um, but the transparency is so important but that's not to say that the rebel groups that we were that we were prosecuting as well as the pro government militia that we prosecuted we did not only prosecute the rebel groups we prosecuted all of those who were committing crimes. That's not to say that they didn't have many supporters. And sure. particularly when we prosecuted the pro-government militia, who was generally well regarded throughout the country to make that process open and transparent. And of course, the courtroom was always open that uh, for, for Sierra Leoneans to come, be in the gallery, watch the trials, and the outreach teams were always taking videos of the trials with a generator, and a and a video player and a television up country to the most remote villages and uh, holding town hall meetings and showing portions of the trials to those who couldn't make the free time. That's great. Okay. So, uh, you know, I think it, we've been talking about how you were recently named as the prosecutor for the residual special court. And I think it may come as a surprise uh, to some of our, our viewers that uh, on like what we think of court cases, um, you know, they're not always tied up in a neat bow. Um, and as you explained too, when you were uh, working during the special court, you were there for almost a decade. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit about what the mandate is for the residual court and how that differs or adds on or contributes to what it was for the special court? Certainly. Uh, yeah, you make the point that uh, I was there a long time, of course, uh, the first two years as a senior trial attorney when I was in charge of one of the cases, uh, the next um, long time, the next uh, seven and a half years or so, uh, I was the chief of prosecutions. Mm -hmm. As the chief of prosecutions, that meant that uh, I, I supervised the day-to-day -day activities of the trial team. Okay. made sure that the, uh, you know, reviewed the trial team's work, what they were doing, made sure that they had, that our team, trial team leaders had the resources they needed to try the cases. And, um, and so that's, uh, that was my duties 
uh, I guess my duties kind of very changed as chief of prosecutions as some of our trials wound down. Uh, later, I, when I was chief of prosecutions, I also assumed the role as uh, chief of investigations and managed the investigations in the later part of the trials and the defense cases, as mm -hmm. well as my last few years in Freetown, when, we, when the trial activity in Freetown had come to a close, and uh, I was the head of office in Freetown because of course the prosecutor at that time, Brenda Hollis was located up in the Hague. So, gotcha. uh, so, so that kept us busy, but leading to the residual court, it, it might not be, it, I think it'd be safe to say that when these tribunals were first established, it wasn't fully appreciated, although those, there were people were thinking about it, but it wasn't fully appreciated what happens when the trials are over? What happens when the trials are done? What happens when the appeals are done? Yep. You don't think about that in a national system because the court system is always there. It doesn't mm -hmm. close down. It's, it's a continuing function. You have the Bureau of Prisons to worry about, uh, to worry about where the prisons are, prisoners are housed and how they're taken care of. So you have a whole system in place that is always there. With the ad hoc tribunals, uh, that's not the case. When the trials are done, you still have prisoners serving sentences. You still have issues of early release. Uh, this is you now the best analogy would be a form of parole, but it's, it's not. But early release allows the prisoner to, uh, and after they've served two thirds of their sentence, it allows the prisoner to serve his sentence someplace other than the prison. In this case, they go back home and serve out their sentence. Uh, okay. You have conditions of confinement. You have court archives and records that must be taken care of. You have motions for review of the proceedings for uh, defense or those that have been convicted may claim that there may try to establish that there's new evidence that could have had an impact on their conviction. Um, all of these types of things that, uh, that you do, in, in our case, we still have one person that was indicted that is unaccounted for. Huh. And so you have the, the concern that if that person is indeed still alive, evidence suggests otherwise, but that if he's indeed still alive, what would happen? Um, and so you have all of these things that a national court system would not think of, the permanent international tribunal would not think of, but mm -hmm. the ad hoc tribunals do have to think of. Yeah. And so, um, so, we, uh, so a residual mechanism is established and uh, our tribunal, of course, the special court for Sierra Leone ceased to exist at the end of 2013 when um, all of the appeals work was completed and uh, Brenda Hollis, who was the current prosecutor at that time, became the residual prosecutor. And uh, of course, she departed last fall for the Cambodia. And yep. I was appointed by the Secretary General to succeed her as prosecutor. So gotcha. um, there are issues that come forward. Uh, probably one of the biggest issues that I didn't mention, and that is uh, we still have continuing obligations towards witnesses. In that, um, you know, we've of course had several hundred witnesses testify before our various trials. Uh, I would say, yeah, probably around upwards over 250 or so witnesses testify before our various tribunals. And wow. uh, these witnesses still have needs, most importantly, protection needs, because um, they, still, uh, they still receive threats. They still have issues concerning their, their protection that, um, that the court has an obligation to follow up because of course their contributions to our convictions, uh, we, could not have, we would not have had our convictions. We would not have had our trials without mm -hmm. the sacrifice that the witnesses made coming forward. And so there is a continuing obligation of the court to provide for the protection and well-being of some of those witnesses. So, uh, so there's a lot of residual functions yeah. that, um, 
that exist that you normally don't think about. Uh, of course, we have our residual court, the uh, mechanism for international criminal tribunals set up by the UN for the, is the residual mechanism for the Rwandan and Yugoslavian tribunals, very much the same mission, um, mm -hmm. although they were still doing some actual judicial work at the time when uh, they transitioned to the residual mechanism. But um, so there's, there's work to be done. Yeah. And quite frankly, as long as you have convicted serving their sentences, there will still be a need for a residual court in some fashion or another. Yep, that uh, makes sense. We regularly respond to, to uh, requests from national authorities for access to our archives. Uh, we of course have uh, extensive archives on uh, the conflict in Sierra Leone, extensive, uh, many, many witness statements mm -hmm. uh, from witnesses, from potential witnesses that never were used. We have an obligation to protect those archives and to see that they're only accessed by those who should have access to those archives. Yeah. No, that makes sense. So, yeah, to have uh, so our open, job, openness and a protection there. Yeah. Yep. So uh, when you look at our residual court, it's a very, very small, it's a small full-time staff. We have four in, still located in Freetown that uh, are responsible for witness issues there. Uh, we have four or five full-time employees in The Hague, including a, a legal off, a prosecution, full-time prosecution legal officer, uh, for the Office of the Prosecutor. Of course, the Registrar is located in The Hague. Uh, she has a, a small staff in The Hague, a legal officer and some support personnel. And uh, as far as I, I am, uh, I am ad hoc in the sense that, uh, you know, I am not a full-time prosecutor. I, of course, do need to visit The Hague and do need to visit Freetown, but fortunately, a lot of the work I can do from my home. Uh, the judges, we have an on-call judges roster that when we need judges, the president is, uh, is a fairly busy person with issues that come up. The president of the, uh, of the special court, who's the head judge of the appeals chamber. Uh, and of course, we have an on-call roster of judges in case additional judicial work, or if we would need to reconvene a panel of judges. Gotcha. And so okay. we have that available, yeah. So I wanna to turn um, to the International Humanitarian Law Roundtable, but you made a comment when we started that I wanna follow up on as well, because it's something that you and I talked about when we were preparing for this. And it's that um, the, the international humanitarian law has is concerned more with why, or sorry, not so much concerned with why you're waging the war, but how you're waging the war. And I think that that, I think that will also come as a little bit of a, uh, of a surprise um, to, to, to our viewers that um, you could be fighting, a, you could be fighting a just war, but if you are not, if you are doing things that amount to genocide or crimes against humanity, then you are committing war crimes. Um, and you could also be the aggressor in a fight, but you could be staying within the bounds of, of what the law, your actions couldn't, wouldn't necessarily rise to the level of prosecute things that are worthy of being prosecuted. Um, and I think that that's a, that's an interesting. Our, our second prosecutor, it's a special court, um, the late Sir Desmond De Silva, uh, made the comment essentially that you can be on the side of angels and still commit crimes in conflict. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the laws of war, when you look at tribunals, you're looking at, at really two branches. You're looking at why you're fighting and how you're fighting. And uh, the why is, is it a war of aggression? Is there an aggressor? Is there someone that has been an aggressive party? Aggression has not been tried since Nuremberg. The International Criminal Court uh, had now has the capability since 2017, I believe, to try aggression, but trying aggression is, um, it's still a 
they still have very, very limited jurisdiction over aggression. Um, basically, aggression is the use of armed conflict against the sovereignty, political integrity, or territory, territorial boundaries of another state in violation of the UN Charter is very roughly, in a broad sense, how, the, how aggression is defined. Um, aggression has always been, it was not, aggression was not a crime in, the, in any of the ad hoc tribunals. Uh, coming out of the Cold War, the major powers were not interested in seeing, uh, seeing trials for aggression. And aggression is typically only try only looked at when you're looking at an international armed conflict, not an internal armed conflict. And it's one state actor essentially against another state actor. Yep. And really the illegal or unjust use of force in against another state is what you're looking at. Uh, the ICC probably has a ways to go before you're gonna see any aggression, aggression um, aggression trials, trials for aggression. Aggression, I think, was from Justice Jackson's perspective, probably the one of close to being the most serious of the crimes when you look at, at international crimes of aggression, crimes against humanity, war crimes and genocide. And, um, and so uh, there, Ben Ferenz, the only living Nuremberg prosecutor has been working nearly his entire life to try and see aggression come back before international tribunals and uh, accountability for aggression come back into play. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, since about 2015, uh, I mentioned how the age of uh, accountability began in about 1993. <clears throat> Unfortunately, that seems to have either come to an end or stalled in about 2015. There's okay. not a lot of, uh, doesn't seem to be a lot of desire on the international level. And certainly the polarization on the Security Council has prevented the Security Council in the United Nations from really carrying out their mandate to maintain international peace and security. And this might be another tea time because I see I've talked much, much longer about the other topic, and I intended to talk more about this, but maybe we can do another tea time soon and cover aggression a little bit. If yeah, you I, think that, I think that would be fun. I do want to talk a little bit about the uh, humanitarian law roundtables uh, before, we, before we take some questions. So the roundtable actually began as the dialogue about uh, 13 years ago, I think 2007. So what, what sort of was the impetus behind their creation? That's right. If we if we were going to have one this year, it would have been the 14th. And uh, Dave Crane started. David Crane, uh, after he left as prosecutor in Sierra Leone, uh, he was the uh, founder of the International Humanitarian Law Dialogues in partnership with the Jackson Center in the early years. And uh, but this was to bring the international prosecutors together in a comfortable relaxed environment that they could discuss the issues that are confronting them today. Mm -hmm. And we've very much gone into, like I say, we're ready for the 14th iteration of this. Um, it has been held, of course, here in, in the Chautauqua area at the Chautauqua Institution every year except 2016 when we held it in Nuremberg on, I believe, the 75th anniversary of the judgment in Nuremberg. Um, this year, we had intended to hold it in London on the, to celebrate the, uh, sorry about that, to celebrate the uh, 75th anniversary of the signing of the London Agreement. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have uh, had to postpone that for one year. And so next year in 2021, uh, we will indeed be holding the International Law Roundtable in London at the historic Gray's Inn in London, where we will bring together former and current international prosecutors to basically discuss the issues of the day, to discuss the issues that are confronting them, to discuss those issues such as how do we get the momentum back 
and moving in the right direction when it comes to holding those accountable for uh, various atrocity crimes. Yeah. And, um, and we're very well attended. The Jackson Center has been a sponsor, a host, and a huge supporter of the dialogue since their beginning. And of course, continue to be so, to do so. And I know you want to save a few time, minutes for questions, but maybe I'll just say that although we're not going to be in London until 2021, the first weekend in August, which will then of course not be the 75th anniversary of the signing of the agreement, but the 76th anniversary, but maybe we'll still call it the 75th anniversary. Well, it'll but, be the 75th observe. There we go. That's, hey, that, I like that. I like that. We'll add that to the title. But, uh, but keep, your, keep your eyes open. Maybe we'll try to do something this year to, uh, on that anniversary of August 8th. Yes, it would, it would seem to be a shame to let it go by without some, some acknowledgement, certainly. Um, yes. Right. All right, so why don't we open it up for questions? Um, Jim, I think I told you this is the part where I usually talk about what's in your mug. Uh -huh. uh, Yes, and you no, have one, I haven't you shown have one my of the classic mug. Jackson Center mugs. That's right. I have an older version of the mug, as you can see, but uh, I don't drink a lot of tea and I don't drink coffee, so mine has water in it. Mm. Gotcha. Okay. Well, nice hydration. I went with, a, because we were talking a lot about Sierra Leone, I went with a rooibos. I went with a, a, an African tea. Um, I, try, I try to be a little thematic with my teas. Well, and, <laughs> and if you hadn't told me that was an African tea, I wouldn't have known. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, good. Okay. All right. So we have a question from Jeremy. Um, and he says he assumes you head into the tribe with head into the tribunals with um, an attitude of no expectations or certainly no preconceived notions about what you're going to find or who you may be charging. Um, so let me let me start. Is that is that a correct characterization? Like, do you head into these tribunals with a we we are keeping an open mind you know to all possibilities or is it a matter of because and especially in the case of sierra leone because the the country asked you to investigate um sort well, of what was the mindset going into that well first the answer to the question is of course you go into any criminal investigation and you go where the evidence leads you mm -hmm. and uh and that was that was very clear within the office of the prosecutor that was very clear with the we're from, from the prosecutor on down, that we go where the evidence leads us. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that although we were invited, the uh, government of Sierra Leone requested help from the, uh, from the United Nations to establish this tribunal, and the Secretary General, with, with uh, support from the Security Council, set up the tribunal it is very clear that we take instructions from absolutely nobody. One of the, in the statute of the special court, it very much says the prosecutor is, an, is independent. He takes no instruction from any government, from any source, from the United Nations, from anybody. We were an independent organ. I am an independent prosecutor. And my mandate to me is very clear that I do not take instructions from anybody. And uh, so you, of course, have to go into these with an open mind. Uh, don't get me wrong. You're, you've watched the news. You've got some idea of what's going on in there. But, um, but you go where the evidence takes you, period. Well, that makes sense. Were there, so because you had mentioned, you know, you watch the news, you have a sort of sense. Were there things that you went in perhaps sort of anticipating would appear? Um, that did not, or where, or where, or were there things you thought might be okay that you ended up realizing, no, this is a bigger challenge or a bigger issue than we thought there would be. I know that's oh, kind of a big gosh. I, I think that we all, remember I mentioned earlier that you're going into the whole country's a crime scene. And uh, granted there had been some conflict mapping done by a few NGOs that you look at and, uh, and you know, maybe to give you a current example of something like this, because of course, the inability right now to see new ad hoc tribunals created 
or to see referrals to the International Criminal Court for conflicts that may not be a party to the Rome Statute, you have seen the UN creating a few independent mechanisms to gather evidence together and to try and preserve evidence. You have a mechanism for Syria, you have a mechanism for Myanmar to try and preserve evidence to, uh, well, just that evidence is perishable and you need to try to preserve it. And so you have mechanisms uh, trying to collect evidence, gather evidence and preserve that evidence so that if an accountability mechanism is set up at some point in the future, they have kind of a jump start. really. They have mm -hmm. this. But even when, a, if a prosecutor is ultimately appointed and a mechanism is ultimately set up, they're still gonna have to go in with an open mind and review all of the evidence that's available, uh, put the proper value and credibility to that evidence and move forward with an independent judgment on who should be uh, indicted, those that should be uh, held responsible. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And you, you said something there, and I think maybe we'll wait till we have our conversation about aggression. Um, but also, I think that might uh, come as a bit of a surprise that the um, there are, unless you are a signatory to to the ICC, um, that you are the, their ability to prosecute you um, is is restricted. Um, and you know, so you know, the, there's the if the Security Council refers it, that's one thing. But if it's referred by a member state or if the ICC prosecutor initiates it, then unless that member, unless the affected member state or their nationals um, have, have ratified the amendment, there's, there's not a whole lot that can be done. Well, that's right. That's right. Of course, the Security Council can refer a conflict to the International Criminal Court anywhere, whether, right. whether the, the state that's where the conflict is taking place is a state party or not. That's happened in the Sudan. That's happened in, in Libya, for example. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, only states that are state parties to the ICC are subject to its jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. And it has to be the conflict, the crime had to take place either within a state that's a state party or perpetrated by a, um, by a member by a citizen of a state party. Now, this of course, and this is beyond our discussion today, but the controversy on the ICC uh, investigation into what's going on in Afghanistan and how could Americans become subject to that investigation? Because yeah. of course the crimes are, if there are crimes that have taken place, they're alleging to have taken place in Afghanistan, which is a state party to the International Criminal Court. So that is how the ICC could potentially gain jurisdiction over uh, members of a non-state party to the International Criminal Court. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. All right, good. I think that will be an excellent uh, discussion for us next time. Yeah. Um, th thank you, Jim, so much for being with us today. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. I know we didn't get to everything we wanted. I, I apologize for that. You didn't, you didn't tell me to move on. <laughs> No, wait, the, the flow was perfect, Jim. It was, it was, it was very good. Um, next week, I will be talking with Stephen Vladek, who is a professor at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law. We're going to be talking about presidential power with a particular focus on the uh, Defense Production Act. Um, and then in two weeks, and I'm saying this now because uh, if you have questions for, uh, for our, our guests in two weeks, you're going to need to submit them a little bit in advance. So, in two weeks, I will be speaking with Navi Pile, who served as the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights for four years. She has a, a very long and storied career. She's also uh, been a defense attorney for anti-apartheid activists. She was an acting judge on the South Africa High Court after apartheid. She was a judge on the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, as, uh, as Jim mentioned. And uh, she's a judge on the uh, appeals chamber for the International Criminal Court. Um, and, and she was our... She was our keynote speaker at the round table last August. That's right. And that's where I got the chance to meet her, which was amazing. Um, given the time zone difference between where I am and where Navi is, we're going to have to record her uh, conversation in advance. So if you are interested in submitting a question to her, we're going to be talking about human rights uh, in a pandemic. Um, but if you have general questions about human rights or any part of her career, 
please don't hesitate to submit them. And you can uh, email us at info at roberthjackson.org. Again, that's info at roberthjackson.org. You have about a week or so to do that because I am talking with her a week from tomorrow. So um, I look forward to that. Jim, thank you so much for being here. This has been really interesting. Always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good afternoon.